me, um, let me show my screen. And um, you guys tell me if you can see that or not. Yeah, we're seeing you. Okay, good. I don't know. I'm going to make you a little picture in the corner there. All right. Um, yeah, I need to go back. All right. Functions as a service. Um, talk a little bit about me for a second. I um, and My name is Miguel Gonzalez. I'm a back end engineer with the Recharge Payments on the Platform Services team. We write cloud functions in mostly Python and Node.js that process data. Um, we do subscription payment processing. If you've ever seen the little subscribe and save button next to one of your online merchants, uh, chances are we're doing the back end processing of that. I found out later on after I joined the company that was always also a customer a couple of years back when we had to give a subscription to Baby Formula when we started having kids. It was kind of interesting to see myself in the data years later. But, but um, that really, really joining, joining this team got me really into cloud function. We process a ton of data um, every day, sending web votes, receiving web votes. But um, at the end of the day, a cloud function is a sim simple, simple purpose a piece of code that is triggered by events. These can be HTTP events, these can be um, maybe a pub sub or RapidMQ event. Um, we're moving towards uh, patching Kafka here in the near future, which is more of like event streaming than um, your typical message streaming that some of you guys may be familiar with. But at the end of the day, you can create a network of cloud functions and solve cloud complex problems. Um, and best of all, you don't have to worry about infrastructure. It's not like back in the day where we had a data center that you had to create a, a piece of hardware or even virtualize a, a, a VM to um, the Linux instance and then set up all the, the, the various packages that you needed to there. Um, this is all kind of handled for you. Um, so, so enter FOSB. Um, a FOSB is, is a subset of open FOS. Um, it's a lightweight and portable engine. Um, and it's kind of just a reimagined open file, so you can run it on a single host. You don't have to have a lot of requirements. Um, Internet of Things is a big use case for this. Setting up a development environment is a big use case for this. Um, it's very just easy to get a little piece of code up and running, and you can see it on your own computer. Um, so, uh, again, if you have a, a cost sensitive project or need the development environment set up, you can run it locally on VPS or even on Raspberry Pi. Uh, and you, you just need a few functions to run your services without the cost of the cluster. You can deploy it um, as an embedded app on an Internet of Things type gadget. Um, and you've got a lot of edge uses that you can, you can put it on. But it really lets you package up five functions and put it in places that you wouldn't normally put it in. Um, just, you know, the, this has been a cloud thing for so long, but now this gives you the opportunity to put it in anywhere in, in we want, really. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of um, what one of these serverless functions um, looks like. I think we can go through a quick demo here. Um, yeah. I'm part of PyCharm up and running. Um, at the end of the day, um, really, you, the, one of the cool things I find about these guys is that you can write it in many different languages. Uh, Go is popular. Um, and you'll see that a lot of these uh, look the same. You've got a handle or a handler function that uh, the, the, you know, the orchestration software will call anytime that it gets an event to process this um, piece of code. Um, there's even a PHP version. If there's any PHP guys in the room, you can write these in PHP, which I, I, thought, I thought was funny. I've been writing so much PHP back in the day. But, um, you know, it, it, it kind of just lets you encapsulate your code in single purpose um, files that, that then. Um, can, can do their thing back and forth. Um, so, you know, the Node.js looks a little bit different for, for any of the, the new guys that might be on the call. You don't have a handle, but there's an async function. So it's just looking at context and a callback, and then you can async and asynchronously do things as part of that. Um, Python is uh, uh, the, the one that, that I use the most just because it's the nature of what I want to do. And again, you have a handle function. Um, in this case, we've got a little bit of a payload that we're going to return. I call this function payment. I was just trying to, to test it out and see how these guys um, work a little bit differently than what I'm used to with um, the Google Cloud functions that I work with every day. Um, Lambda's another big one. If it's any AWS guys, they, they have their own way of doing these things. But at the end of the day, again, it's just a little piece of code that um, you can um, use for a single purpose and then talk to other cloud functions 
with a number of it. And once it's done processing, it's thing. Um, so I wanted to show you a quick demo because I got this up and running earlier. And um, this is not for Nomad. I think Garrett's going to show you guys some of the, the Nomad side of this um, in a second. But um, what, I, what I did is install it locally. Um, you, you get uh, uh, an IP address that's running through Docker. And in this case, I think I'm using Multicast to, um, to, to do the bunch of virtualization in here. But, um, this was a kind of a fun test that I did. There's a, a couple of um, just cloud functions that are available out there that are ready in the open repository for you to play with. And I found a curl one and I found a cow one. The cow one, um, all you do when you invoke it, it returns a ring of cow. Um, and you can see, you know, this uh, cool cow or a, or a flirtatious cow. Um, the, the curl call is actually a, a demonstration of how you can call this function um, uh, just as part of the, the, the whole um, the orchestration side of this. So let's say I want to take this URL right here and use my curl um, function here and put it in the body. This is literally, like I said, this is the curl cloud function calling the cows cloud function. Um, just making an HTTP cow and a cow call and uh, returning the payload back to you. So as you go, you can, you can kind of see you get a little bit more information about the response stats and um, you, you get your random cow just like that. Um, uh, that's kind of showing you there. And um, you can, the, the scroll call um, can go out to Google, hashreport.com, or anywhere else. Um, I'll show you that. Whoops. Mr. H. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go. It failed. We got a big battery. That was part of the demonstration. <laughs> there you go. And you got your big payload of the whole um, MasterCore.com uh, site there. And, you know, I'll, a big use case for, for platforms, especially you know, people that are just kind of playing around or, or trying to learn these things, is uh, screen scraping. So you, you can do something like this to go out and, and uh, when you did a stock market site, and then um, Got the, your payload, and you do a little regular expressions, and you get the the, the current price of stock, or maybe see where the S and P five hundred is. Uh, you can use these guys to um, maybe swarm a site where you were trying to get in on a. Um, I don't know, they're putting out a, a new deal on. Uh, we have some, some old co-workers that are really big in streaming. He got into writing bots that would go on the Supreme site whenever they're um, with one of their drops and try to get in to um, get what he wanted instead of having to go and click, 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 click. But, you know, you can scale these up pretty well. So you maybe you can have 10 of these going at the same time, or maybe you've got 100. Or in the case of what we're processing millions of web hooks coming in, we, we scale up to several thousand of these guys that are all, all um, processing data for us. Um, so, you know, that, that really kind of shows you the, some of the power of the cloud function and quick little demonstration to see how they can chat back and forth with over HTTP. Um, and does anybody have any questions at this point? Uh, let's check and see. Anybody in the room? We got some new people in the room that just walked in. Let me give you the quick brief overview, and then we'll go to the sure. Q and A. Uh, we're we're gonna we're going to do some live coding today uh, by the seat of our pants. It's never been tested. We probably won't make it work, but it'll be fun. We'll tinker mm -hmm. together. Um, Miguel has put together. Uh, so Fosdi is is a next generation version of Open Files, which is a function as an open source function as a as a service uh, 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 platform. Um, I work at HashiCorp. We put out Nomad, which is an orchestrator. Um, recently, somebody submitted a open fo or a FOSD uh, pack, which is like a comic kind of like account chart, if you're familiar with what those are, mm -hmm. where it'll just, you know, it'll go run, a, it'll run FOSD inside the Nomad cluster for us. And uh, we're going to attempt to get his functions running inside Nomad using this pack and then even make hopefully make the, the uh, hopefully the pack writer has made it you know foot gun proof to get the net networking setup part done because I think that's going to be the real fun part. Um, so that's just to catch you all up on what we're working on. So Nomad would be kind of a ready sort of yeah, it's, it's, it is very much that in that vein, uh, a lot more performant, and it can run multiple work, workloads. Uh, so we could run containers, but we could also run uh, just a service. We could do raw exec uh, commands. We could run 
.NET uh, binaries. We could run Java with a dri Java driver. Uh, we can run workloads on GPUs with NVIDIA. Uh, so just, you know, it's working. It's, it's, it's essentially, yes, it's a workload orchestrator, but not constrained to Docker containers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Derek, by the way. Thanks so much for coming. We'll do more socializing in person when it's over. Uh, but uh, so Miguel, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, let's go see if we've got, I'm gonna move you out of full screen mode. Let's see if we got any online answers or questions rather uh, over in, in, uh, looks like there's something in, uh, in the chat window. We're gonna get pretty inception-y here in a minute, I think folks, I apologize for that. Uh, it doesn't look like I've got any, any questions coming in. Uh, okay, cool. So we've got, uh, let's go back to ZL. All right, so that was that. I pulled down those container images that you mentioned uh, earlier, right? So I think next step, let's, let's go over to the Nomad side of the house. Um, I've got Nomad available uh, as a local binary. Uh, in a, in a real production environment, you know, you'd be running uh, three servers for high availability. Uh, it would have any number of clients that take the workload. The servers are in charge of the state management and orchestra you know, orchestration, sending work to clients. Clients do the work. Uh, clients have different capabilities, yada, yada. They, they register, they get fingerprinted when they connect to the server. They go, hey, I can do Java, or I can do Docker, or I can do whatever. And then the orchestrator says, great, the server, the server control plane says, okay, great. Um, you know, when I get a job in Java, I'll know where I can place it and, uh, and, and what have you. For development mode or demos like this and other reasons, you know, we, we've got a dev command, right? Where you can, spit it, you can spit it up and the one process will act as both a server and an agent, okay? So we will go ahead and spin that up right now. And uh, once it gets started, I will bring up the UI for you so we can kind of follow along over there. Uh, by default, Nomad server will run on 4646. And this is what the UI looks like. Uh, we can do you know, everything you do to the UI, you can do, this, do the CLI and more for, you know, if that's where you like to live or if you need to do automated automation tasks or whatever, but here we are. So right now, how many jobs are we? Um, so let's do a quick thingamabob just to kind of like, we're gonna talk about a, a, another tool we recently built that I, I help write and Charlie helps write. Charlie's here in the room. Uh, it's called Nomad Pack. And Pack is our, uh, our solution for sharing um, what we call job specs. The job spec is an HCL file that basically says, hey, this is something I want you to run in the cluster. Right? And here's its network configuration, and here's its, you know, this is the Docker image to use if you're going to pull a Docker image, or here's the command to issue if you're going to run an exec command, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? So it kind of gives you a declarative way to, to say, hey, this is what I want the cluster to be using. Um, and so to give you a, some, an example of what one of those looks like, uh, let's do. Here we go. So a job file kind of looks like this. And in this particular one, it says, hey, I've got this job. I'm going to call it gateway test. It lives in data center one. Uh, the data center one could, ends up being like a constraint. If you have multiple data centers, one place or anywhere else, right? Things like that. We've got regions, things like that. I'm going to stop shilling no that. I'm just going to talk about the things that matter. So I want to, you know, I'm going to, I got this group of tasks that I'm going to run. I want two of uh, this group to run. Here's my network configuration. I have a name for it called inbound on 8181. Uh, I'm going to register service in this case because it's, it's using service discovery. Here's some inf configuration information about the service that's going to run. And then here's the task. I want to run uh, a Redis container. And I'm going to use the image Redis 33.2. Okay, so we can run that. Um, so let's do that, actually. Let's go. And say no matter run that. Oops. Uh, 8500. Oh, that's not going to work because it's got some uh, networking configured that. Uh, 
It was a bit short. I'm sorry, you yeah. know my job a bit short? Yes, and that'll get you the, the redis. Job init short. Is it how short? Minus one short. Uh, I already have an example. Here we go. And so we'll just say nomad job run example nomad. There you go. And it's, it's off to the races. I wanted three, place three. You can see the server over here kind of logging things out. And if you go over here, and refresh the screen. We got the example job is running, and um, here you go. It's all is right in the world. So, what does Nomad Pack solve? Well, you know, you can imagine if you have a complicated um, uh, setup or a lot of different setups or things you want to do again and again and again and again, right? Like this could get really toilsome. Right? Like, I gotta create all these configuration files, and every time I need to put data 71 in it, or I need to put this, or I need to put that. Would it be cool if I had like a templating system where I could compose templates and so on and so forth so that I could work smarter, not harder? Well, more like a helm. Okay. Like a helm, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, enter Nomad Pack. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I've got Nomad Pack, uh, alias on my machine is MPD. Uh, these are the commands that you know it uh, supports right now. You can plan a pack, you can render it. Like if you want to, like you know, each one of these things is a template, right? So it supports variables. Uh, you can feed it a variables file or some variables and some arguments, and you can call render, and it will actually execute the template with the variables you specified. So if you wanted to output that to like source control or just debug your pack template or whatever, right? Like it's a useful feature. Uh, and then you can run things and destroy things with it, and then registries are a way to download packs. Well, I've got a registry already uh, on my local machine uh, called uh, default, and uh, it's got all these packs. Well, where did these come from? Well, these are all available right now on, um, well, we've got it over here in the Nomad Pack Community Registry on GitHub under the HashiCorp uh, uh, Organization. And in that pack situation, we've got um, open file, uh, where was it? I think I scrolled past it, FOSD. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a bunch of text files. Um, here in the readme, the pack author, which is a community submission, not, you know, nothing official. So if, if we run into, uh, into any issues, you know, you get the support you pay for. Um, but the uh, you know here's all the variables this person went to to you know to the, the trouble they're exposed to us, um, uh, so that we can hopefully can figure this thing to run. So I'm just gonna like take a shot in the dark and in the spirit of live coding and learning in a group and in public, like I'm just gonna run it and see what happens. So I'm gonna say npd uh, run and again npd stands for Nomad Pack uh, Dev. I put the D there because I want to know that it's my dev build. This is actually running from source. Uh, it might have bugs because it's running from today's source. And if it does, you can blame the two of us because we probably checked in those things or approved the check in. So apologies in advance. So we're going to run um, Fozzy. Cool. So it's successfully deployed. <laughs> Do we believe it? <laughs> it's a lie. <laughs> I think it might be a lie too. Let's go find out. I, I don't trust things. Do you trust things? Well, not computers anyway. Yeah, well, the funny thing about computers, they do what you tell them to. Oh, look. It's, uh, I, I keep wondering whether they'll catch on. Yeah. So let's go back over here. It says, uh, it says it ran and it registered successfully, but it's still pending. Well, that's interesting. Let's do an NPD stack. And again, this is the Nomad Pack tool. Uh, is it status? That cheated. I already did one. What is that? Um, that? I already cheated. I already saw what it said. Oh yeah, what did it say? It's got a constraint for Linux. Uh, oh, it's got a Linux constraint. Yes. Okay. Well, that's okay. You know what? I have a Linux machine. Yes. I, I can make this work. Yes. Yeah. So let's uh, let's do this. So we're going to exit out again. We're live. So what's, so what's the server it was trying to run on? So right now he's got that dev agent that's running on his local Mac. Oh, okay. And um, in the that fuzzy package. Uh, the author provided a, a variable that contains a constraint, and the constraint is specified so that it only runs on those machines. 
So what Derek's Nomad is sitting there and pending, waiting for, is for a Linux client to join this cluster so that it can schedule it to it. And since that's not going to happen, <laughs> ever, we'll be impending uh, ad infinitum. So, so is that, that the, how many is your Mac? Is that an Intel Mac still, or is it the Apple chip thing? No, it's an Intel. It's a couple, it's two years old. Um, let's see, Bit Nomad. So this will prove, I'm gonna do Bit Nomad version uh, because I need to prove that it's got a, a Linux format. This should fail mm -hmm. if I built the yeah, upgrade. I built it for Linux last from the Bayer machine I'm about to spin up. So let's do this. Oh, but now I'm going to have to get Pack over there. So that'll be fun. You can, uh, yeah, we'll figure that out. I just w get that, or curl it up, curl it up at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just don't know the URL by heart, but we'll get it. All right, so I'm going to say Vagrant, which is another cool tool from uh, HashiCorp if you're not familiar with it. Uh, it is, uh, oh, I think it's going to just resume because I think I halted it. it it's, a, it's a way to run virtual machines on your local machine for dev environments, et cetera. Uh, Nomad server one. So this is. Yeah, I'm, I mostly work with uh, Terraform. Terraform? Oh, yeah, cool. Terraform is awesome. Uh, I was, I got to, we talked a lot about that at the last meetup, um, and we use it for like our 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 end to end testing environment. It's awesome. Like it's amazing what you can do with that. Like in no, in no time, you've got a fully working cluster. Uh, so what I'm going to have to do here, just kind of talking the folks at home through, in case in case you you know make, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, I'm going to spin up this virtual machine that is a Linux machine. And this Fosti, uh, Miguel, you still there? I should check in with you real quick. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to spin up. Okay, right. I got that children screaming in the background, so I'm staying here. Oh, well, I appreciate that. Um, so, uh, great. So now I've, I've spun up this, this Linux machine uh, so that I can um, I can start Nomad there and then register uh, the workload we want there using pack, and then that FOSD workload should run because it has a Linux constraint and will now be running on Linux. So interesting thing though, my development environment, I have servers and clients. I don't do it all in one dev box. So I gotta bring up a client too so we can submit some have something to run the work. If it was uh, children got a little bit lower voices we can pretend they were management. Uh, that's right. That's right. That's absolutely true. Uh, and then let's say the my client a one. And then what should happen, I'll let that run for a second, then I want to test something real fast. If I do a nomad status. Uh, yeah, I think it's got um, I think it's gonna have uh, like TLS and other things. So so you can well maybe not, hold on. It should be bound to 4646, 46, right? Jeez. So my vagrant box should be viewable here. It's not. Oh, oh, hello. It's because Nomad's not started there. Uh, I, when I shut it down, I had those, uh, I believe I had the servers turned off. So let's go SSH into Nomad server one and make sure the Nomad service started. And then we'll do the same thing over onto the client. And uh, man, I'm really living dangerously uh, because I straight up was trying to break this build over here. So, uh, you know, wish me luck. So I'm gonna do a Nomad version the, share. Um, the, the, cool. the, the function would have the uh, Linux constraint, what was it written in? So it's not, it's not the, so much of the function. I understand okay. the, the, the interpreter had Linux constraint, but I was curious if it was, Anything under, underneath it. I, that's what I'm going to try and dig into now. I'm trying to see what inspired that particular. Um, when I ran it with that, when I, because I tried to run it and knock out the constraint, and I end up, um, there's a prepare task, um, a pre run task in one of the job setups, and it hits, it's hitting a permission denied issue. So I'm, I'm going to continue to see what that is. 
All right, cool. So I've got a client and I've got a server. They're both running the build that I want them to be running. Uh, let's do, uh, let's see if uh, system CTL, oh, I have to do sudo, right? All right, so new Nomad version available. Running one, it looks like it's running. Yeah. Is it running? It's running, but I can't see it. Um, do you, did you have the dev agent up when you started the agent box? Um, because if you did, it will, it will nope. reassign the 4646. No, nope. I, uh, I stopped it over there. Um, second question is, does the Nomad server uh, vagrant endpoint map 4646? I know the Linux one does. I don't know that um, the server and client ones do because you easily get into conflict. Uh, I believe so. We can go check the vagrant file. So that, that's my... Oh, I'm sorry. It's not level host. It's 192.168.56.11. Okay. So it's the vagrant box set up a Another, a bunch of different IP addresses for me so that I can talk to them all. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Uh, here we go. So Nomad's running. Oh, look, it, it remembered my spread job from the last time I was testing. So right. that's cool. So I'm going to do something uh, over here back on my host machine so we can kind of work from here. Uh, Nomad requires, a, a, or not requires, but supports an environment variable uh, called a Nomad Adder. This is the address of the uh, server uh, that your CLI is going to talk to. So I'm going to um, set that to the IP address that I just showed you all. Quack. Boom. Oops. I already had that fun. So if I do that, and I need the port. Then I say no man status. Voila, I should be able to. And there you go. I see the same thing I see in the UI, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. So that means I can now run npd uh, run fastd. And let's see if it shows up. Oh, wait. Let's go double check and make sure that my client's running. That, that my, uh, I'm sorry, my client uh, machines. Uh, now that process is started. Uh, so it's going to be, oops. Should be since you saw the spread job. Yeah, you're right. Well, no, it's pending now. Oh, it's pending? Oh, yeah, you're from the email. Uh -huh. You could also check it out in the UI. It's shut down. Okay, so we'll say uh, to do. Start nomad. And then we'll look back here. And there you go, it's starting the agent. And I bet it'll be started. Oh, look at that, it's running. So the agent started. Great, we have a place to place work. And now we can go back over here to NPD run FOSD. Boom! Pat says it says it got placed. Do we believe it? Is it a liar? Anyone over under? And uh, voila, boom, FOSD is up and deployed. Pending. Pending. Pending deployment. Wonder why. Charlie, did you say you had a spoiler alert for us? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. Missing drivers. Um, do you have Docker running on those Ooh. things? Ooh. Um, no, it's Rockset. You need to enable Rockset on your um, client of this job requires Rockset. So this is going to be, yeah. Yes, this, I'm looking, and this is the thing I'm looking at right now. I'm like, I don't like this. Um, but is log exec enabled in the client, the main, it's not inside the client stands. I can't remember. Yes. It's, uh, it's uh, client what's the client plugins. Plugins. So I can, I can feel that. Uh, so Nomad has several different patch drivers. One of them that's turned off by default is raw exec, which oh, raw. lets you run directly in the context of Nomad. And because Nomad tends to run as root on clients, because it needs to make like firewall and a lot of other stuff, mm -hmm. um, raw exec is considered not optimal. Right. In fact, I can look at that. Okay. Okay. So we'll go over here. If you're not familiar with it, this is what the the uh, doc site looks like. We're gonna look at the client stanza all the way at the bottom. And we're just gonna cheat. And. Uh, Two 
spots here. Okay, so then um, we did just tiny small spots here. It'll be this one works. Here we go, climb the bones. I'm sorry. Yeah. Don't think we just have to cheat it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember uh, what was tested. It's client plugin uh, label broad uh, raw underscore exec enable equals true. Okay. Well, let's just let's just yeah, trust my that. little remember. Sudo vim etsy. No, Matthew. Uh, so this is where the client. We're gonna go edit the. Configuration file that um, that nomad the nomad binary will read when it starts up, and then we'll re we'll bounce the service on the client. So, all right, we're here, and you're saying it's inside the client um, stanza. Yes. So we plug in. Yeah. Did you say? Plug in or uh, plugins? Uh, it's plug in, and then the label is raw raw underscore exec. Uh, quote. Yeah. Like so. it's a, it starts a new block, um, and then inside of that is enable equals true. Ah, sorry, you said that. Voila. Let's see how good my remembers are. Well, your rhythm, your remembers. <laughs> oh, generally suspect. Well, all right. So now I'm going to do system CTL restart. Oh no, it's a plugin for top level. Sorry. It's plugin raw exec config enable equals true. Ah, okay. Well, you know, I'll forgive you. Uh, <coughs> so we're going to do that again. And you're saying, I don't have great vim food, so you all are going to have to watch me type this again. I'm really sorry. Um, plugin. And say that again. That's config open block enable equals true. And the plugin label is raw exec. And enable equals true in here. And then label the plugin block with raw exec. Well, you know, I, mean, I, mean, I, I go back before we had all these uh, window-based systems, and so Emacs was about window-based systems. My very first boss, I was born in, on computers in 1997 when NT, Windows NT was taking over the enterprise, and my very first boss said, oh, you're a Windows baby. Uh, uh, only I can remember who that person was. Um, Apparently, you're feeling much better about it. Yeah, I'm, so, okay. <laughs> I, I'm still a Windows baby. Um, okay, cool. So check it out. Foz is Foz D's running. We actually got to where we wanted to go. Hopefully we learned something along the way. Um, so Foz D's running, but Miguel, you wrote us some functions and we want to run those inside Foz D. So this is really inception, right? Like we're running and almost like, an, like we're running a function orchestrator or I don't know, do they call it an orchestrator? Well, so no. As the orchestrator, this this would be more like a cloud function runner, I guess. Okay. Um, it's kind of like it, it, it kind of handles the environment to run it. Okay. So we're running a a functions as a service platform as an extension to the Nomad 
orchestrator. So this would be like a AWS Lambda or a P native or something? Yeah, 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 exactly. It is totally like it is 100% open source Lambda. That's what it is. Okay. All right. So now, after we fought with all the things we're supposed to know, mm -hmm. now we're going to mess with the things that we admit we don't know. Um, so this is going to be fun. Um, and by fun, it clearly you'll, you must think I'm a masochist. Um, so let's go back and look at the FOSD um, thing, uh, pack. So what, what is the doc, documentation? So this is all you need to deploy FOSD itself, okay? It uses the Docker driver, okay? Constraints, NAS images, gateway image name. Ooh, a gateway Docker image. That makes me wonder if it's maybe pre-configured to allow us to see like an in, like an, in, an ingress or something. So we are going to actually be able to hit an endpoint from the host machine. Um, what else? Q worker image names. There's a bunch of things. There's a bunch of levers here we can pull. Okay. Well, let's go see what the actual D, so it has a vars.nomad file, which is, I think, the default. Yeah, yeah there you go. The default turn, um, the other. I'm sorry, it's not the defaults. It's the user user specified overrides. Yes, it is a central override. So the defaults are defined, defined inside the variables file. So all those things we just saw in the readme have a corresponding ent ent entry in this HCL file with hopefully a default value. So this thing has a job name. So here's where I spotted constraints. Aha, yes, so this is, here we go. So that's where we found that it has a constraint on Linux. Cool. Let's go look at some other things. Ooh, it has a network, NAT streaming image. It's defaulted. Hey, you know what, I'm, I'm curious. Let's go look at what did it actually, what, did it all, what all did it spin did it put out? You maybe just spun on maybe optional. Ooh, look! Five tasks. It gave us a Q worker, a gateway, a NATS machine, a FOSD provider, and a basic auth plugin. And something that ran as a pre-start task to do some like that's the run exec. That's okay. Okay. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. So I'm a little bit hopeful. A little bit hopeful. We've got a So is that something that ran and shut down the pre the Starter this morning. Yeah, the pre-start uh, run ran and completed. Okay. Um, uh, because it's over there in the first part, um, you can do um, sidecars that start as pre-starts, mm -hmm. and they will continue to run through the life cycle of the job. Um, but we'll start first. So that's pretty cool. I'm actually pretty excited about that. Put us, put it in there. That pack of meta. That's exciting. With all the metadata we got in there about what we ran. That's exciting. So all that's right. that's all I have on. Because you deployed a pack, mm -hmm. that set of metadata that would show up in the job is provided by pack as part of it deploying it. So for for the uninitiated, Miguel, if I was running this like on bare metal, what would I do to register my container with FOSD? How would I do that? Is there like a CLI or something that's wrong? Yes, there is a FOSD CLI that you maybe you build it and then you deploy it. Um, you get hooked that up to Docker Hub. Uh, um, to, to any kind of repo that, that you have, I think GCP has a repo that you could set these up, and then from there it could deploy right on to the, to, um, to, to FOSD. Um, now, what I I did, and I was having trouble getting my my images baked and pushed up to Docker where, where I left off this afternoon. So that's where I found the, the ones that were pre-configured in the um, in their store to be able to at least show them. Um, so the the curl and that that cow, um, those images that I sent, you should be able to hook right in there. They're ready to go. So they're just they're already pre-configured to connect fast to if they if they're in the right yes, environment. Sure. Ooh, interesting. So so we also use Docker, the actual Docker command to build our Docker images, or something else. To do what? To build the image? Yeah, yeah. You actually still use the Docker command. Yeah, yeah. So I guess there's a bunch of competitors out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, in this situation, I think he used like a Docker file to spin it up and everything. All right, so now that's interesting. I downloaded it here, but I didn't download it to um, to uh, the Linux machine. Uh, so let me go get those. Let me go pull those real quick. Go back to Docker pull. Um, 
so what all things can I can I write my uh, D and you're using Docker, but I could I could do other kinds of things. Oh, the, the Boz libraries, the functions of service, um, there are a ton of programming implementations you can use to build functions because it, okay. it defines the API that you're writing to. So, but uh, from like what Miguel said, there are the Python implementations, Golang, pretty much a lot of the things people are, people want to write small to blow functions. Yeah. Uh, Node, as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. You were, you were saying Java, which is typically not small, but. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I'm going to do something silly. Which which directory am I in? Okay, I don't want to be there. I'm going to go to uh, my home directory. For reason, because reasons. Uh, so nomad, what was it? Nomad job. Uh, uh, short. Nomad job init. Init. Thank you. Minus short. So that's going to give me an example file. Yeah, that'll give you a res. So let's do uh, example, and then I'm going to do. I'm going to put this image that Miguel told me to run in here. And you're saying, Miguel, correct me if I'm wrong, this is pre configured to just sort of like attach and connect? I should. All right. I experience. So, all right. Let's see what happens. Uh, so then, oops, you know what? I'm going to be really pedantic and I'm going to name it something different so that we know this is going to be cows. You need to change any networking numbers? Well, that's an interesting question. Do I, Miguel? Is there anything? I mean, does it matter what ports? I'm not going to say leave the name what it's named because it might have a configuration built in that needs to. So, in this case, I would tear out those network calls. And it's right behind the fails to change back. Because those are exposes, not allowed to talk to us. Okay. So, like in this case, cows is not going to expose a port, it's going to talk to the FAS server to run. Right. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And we're going to call this and cows. Right? Yep. And then it's using driver. And then yeah. I'll pull that port yeah. What's that? Yeah, name that port line. So I'm just saying, hey, go run this image for me. Yep. And then this is just some resource constraints. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Miguel, you think I'm missing here or that you're scared of? I'm sorry, I'm thinking muting myself. Um, I think you can just let it rip. Sweet. All right, so I'm going to run an example. Work! Work! Desired one, placed one. Let's go back to the. Ooh! It's running. Okay. That's pretty cool. It ran, but how do we prove that it's taught that it's connected? Any ideas? Anyone? You got logs? Uh, we do have logs. Uh, let's see. You could try to make a crow about too. We could. Um yeah, okay. Thank you. I think it doesn't look like a link. Yeah. Got it down to the tasks. No. I remember the first time I discovered those were all clickable. Yeah, and logs are the oh. top. Oh, do you find the view now, man? Oh, that's awesome. It's next to the overview in the gray guy. Yeah. Yep. And then listening on port 3000. Okay, now we will probably need to wire in 3000. Oh, look at that. All right, so I want to turn on standard error from function, standard error from function. Listening on 8080. Or 8080. Let listening on 8081. And then node 14, question mark, <laughs> listening on 14,000. Okay, so we will want to plumb through 8080 and 3000. That's my favorite node, 14. Yeah. Listening on 8080 and listening on 8081 for metrics. All right, so talk me through. What is this madness you're talking about, Charlie? This plumbing. What do I do? Okay, so Talk, explain like I'm five for the people at home. Some some of the things we just tore out from the sample no. job. Mm -hmm. 
are the way in which we define how a service port is exposed to the rest of the universe. Okay. And so in this case, these containers need to be able to expose those ports that they're listening on. So we want to recreate the service description and I will tell you the truth, the easiest answer is to go burn that example down and recreate it from short. Right. Because that will stop us from several typographical errors. Or I can just do this because I've got the ability to have the power. I have it somewhere else. If you have it handy. I do have it handy. And that will uh, spare you some time because. Yeah, and we are running out of time, folks. I apologize for the folks at home. And if we don't get through this, maybe we'll pick it up next, next time around and keep going because it's been fun. And I'm really, again, grateful for everybody who showed up. Um, to, oh, you know what? I think it's right here in this. Yeah, I think it is. Oh, that's the long one. Oh, that's the long one. Um, you can do a nomad. That's fine. I got you, it. You I can also, it. if you add the file name at the end of it, it will let you make it not example. So you oh, can do nomad and then short. You don't have to even put the job in there. Just nomad and then short. Um, and then add a job name. I just call it cache. Uh, no, no. Sure. I like it. And now we can look at the short version. So. so the network stands up there at the top inside the group, defines that we have a port that we're going to name DB. The scheduler is going to arbitrarily create a port and map it to 6379 in the case of Redis, which is Redis's talking port. For ours, we've got those two ports. We don't know what they are, but we'll call them something. Okay. And we will map one of, you know, we'll do, and we'll do them as static ports because I don't know, I don't know enough about FAS to know how to make the port aiming well. All right, so this goes under the group level. So we're going to come over here. Oops, got to hit I. Uh, put this here. And I don't know. There we go, that seems reasonable. And let's just, for the sake of being fun, we'll call it cows. And it's 8080, right? If I remember correctly. One was eight, there was a, there was one at 8080 that we wanted to map. So one, three three one at 3000. And we don't know what either one of them do. Mm. Miguel, do you know which one is does what? Wait, um, I'm, I didn't catch that question. It was hard to. So we've got standard out says something's listening on port 3000. And standard error says that something's trying to listen on port 8080. 8080 is the one that uh, the demo um, that I did use. So that's probably where the 8080 is coming from, unless that's configured with no name set. It's probably 3000, it's just Node.js yeah. itself, because that's like the default port, right? But it's like the default port from Node.js, but it's a root port. Yeah. Well, you know what? If one doesn't so try to. So do static equals 8080? Okay. Yeah, so that'll tell the scheduler not to make a port for it, and it will just map it. There's a YAML file that you, you set with one of these cloud functions that allow you to set the gateway and the port for these things. However, you know, you're using a pre-baked image off the internet, so I would imagine that's that set of 88 because it's it's you know, configured to do so. Okay. Let's start with 8080 and does it work? Well, you know, I don't know. Do the other one inside config log. both. <laughs> I think you could do that actually. Yep. Uh, but then we won't know which one worked. <laughs> well, you'll, you're still going to end up having to target when you do your car. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So, oh. All right, what's that? Your high intensity testing. Did yes. I? Cows, cows, looks good. All right. Okay. So now I can run it again, right? And it should update it. But let's do this real quick just to show off this handy dandy feature. Plan. Uh, yep, it added a port. Sweet. So let's run it. All right, placed healthy. Let's go back over here to job cows. What should we see here? You should see one complete and one running. And look at it, it is complete. And version zero of the job stopped because we made a change that was destructive and the new one's fine. And it replaced it with a new config. And there, your handy dandy host address would be the thing that you would curl. In your case, since you're on the, yep. you need to just replace that with that 192 address. Let's try that. 
whichever one is the one I need to address for the client. Oh, it's going to be 21. Okay. Oops. <sighs> one of these days. Um, so, so, so writing these kind of config for something new is, is fun. The real pain comes when you're trying to retrofit something on the ultra, yeah. like some third party, you know, software, and you're trying to make it deployable <laughs> it's, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a flexible manner. Uh, that can be that be real fun. Uh, you can uh, slash. Yes, I do. The thing I like about Nomad in that case, um, your colon, yeah, your colon drifted out of the front and way into the end of the line. So if you're missing the colon out of HTTP. Uh, I, I am, because I pasted it in the wrong spot. Yes, I did. But on, actually, on client one, you could go to, you could curl uh, 80, 88. Um, it will need to be the, the one that need the 10.0.2.15 um, because it will not buy the local host. And it has to be the, um, on the inside of the client, it's the 10.0.2.15. Oh, I gotcha, I gotcha, I gotcha. So let's go get that address. I'm going to do logical things, Charlie. Oh, God. I'm trying to tell you how to live your life. Just, yeah. Just trying to tell you how to live your life. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, so my wife's got a map, too. You tell her to right click and she looks at you like you're from another planet. It's like, you know, there is a right click picture, but there's no actual like, right button, you know? It's like, I don't even think about it, right? I think it was the right click, but. Yeah. But she's like, we need right click. <laughs> <laughs> We have a very high cow, people. Okay, so the cow function, your cow container, nice. the cow provider is, is returning to that cow. It's working inside the cluster. So we haven't wired it. So we're not having the FAS, the FAS isn't summoning that answer yet. Right. But our um, function is there. Our function is there and working. Well, I have bad news. We're out of time. It's five till. I gotta wrap it up. Last time I abused our good hosts here at the domain kept them here till eight o'clock at night. But this is fun and this is cool. This gives us a place to pick up next time. Uh, we'll forget all of this by then, I'm sure. Uh, so we'll do a little bit of prep work next time uh, and see if we can't get this running. Um, and yeah, we saw a cow. That was fantastic. But with that, so. yeah, forgiven that we let's see. Let's let's do a real quick recap. We had like. Introduce the internet to Vagrant, introduce the internet to Nomad, introduce the internet to FOSD, then go figure out ourselves how to try to get FOSD up and running with Nomad Packet, another thing the internet has to introduce people to. And then we uh, actually got a workload running inside the cluster to prove that inside the cluster it's working itself. Now we got to see is it, it, so next time we'll figure out, okay, is it talking to FOSD the way it's supposed to, and how do we look at it outside of so if I wanted to catch up to where you are, I'd need, um, uh, well, I already got Docker, so I'd need Nomad and Vagrant, probably. Uh, yeah, Vagrant would be very helpful for you. I can give you some helpful links. I'll post some on the Meetup site as sure. well. I just posted a thing in our discuss forums about how to use Vagrant and get, get a test, Nomad test cluster up and running. Um, the other thing, I, oh, uh, what else do we need? So we, we Nomad pack, but then you got to go to the pack registry and get the um, the FOSD pa uh, pack downloaded, right? So you get download the registry, mm -hmm. use pack to deploy that, and then we had to create a job file. So I'll put uh, something together in a GitHub repo, and then put it on the Meetup page uh, so that, to try to make it a little bit easier for folks. Uh, maybe we'll even do that while we're eating pizza here. Uh, everybody online, thank you for joining us. Uh, it was Adventures in Live Learning. I hope you enjoyed it. I did. Um, we'll be back in four months' time. 
and we'll, I, I, unless somebody has a, a, a better request, we'll just keep working on this project and, and see how far we can get the next time. Um, so thanks everyone for joining and uh, take care, happy hacking. Cool. All right. Oh, we're still seeing.